Okay. Good morning. <laughs> good afternoon. Good evening. I guess where everybody is today, since it is sort of this wonderful virtual event. Thank you for having me. Do you want me to just jump in? Um, yeah, I'm quickly checking. I can hear you well. I see the camera and the shared screen. So I would say um, welcome again and feel free to go. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you all. So Tina Sturgis here. I am the manager of partner and channel marketing here at GitLab. Uh, here's some of my stats. Please check me out on Twitter, LinkedIn, and more importantly on uh, GitLab.com to see all the wonderful things that I've been up to. Um, let's see. All right, so checking, I am moving on. Uh, the presentation that we're doing today is GitOps, the future of infrastructure automation. Thanks for hanging in here with us today. Um, super excited about being able to present this. I'm gonna take a little bit step back in history of sort of how the landscape of software development has changed over time. Um, I think it's a great level set of where and how we got to uh, GitOps and the definition of that GitOps and let's get going. So basically, the way that we worked, if you look at the bottom left hand side is wa uh, waterfall, right? So software development started there. These were very large um, projects, <laughs> if you will. Uh, they were very long in duration. Um, they also were, um, we're still using this methodology today, quite honestly. It's very sequential, has very long cycles. We don't do a lot of learning. We do a lot of doing in a sequential way. Uh, when we're doing waterfall, which obviously proposed a problem uh, in the software development life cycle, in the software development life cycle in and of itself, is we wanted to be able to learn our lessons a lot faster and be able to deliver things faster into production. So we moved into agile. So as we're moving across to this modernization, we moved into agile. So that was great, right? So agile brought us that smaller amount of changes in faster iteration. Um, within our projects. So we were able to accomplish a lot of work. We were able to incorporate a lot of those best practices and lessons learned much earlier in the cycle with Agile. But what happened at this point as we started to modernize everything is development was actually working much faster than ops could handle, right? So at the end of the day, as development goes through, they actually start to iterate, they actually start to deliver faster. Op says, wait a minute, I can't handle all of this um, demand to get this into production. I need all of my checks to make sure it's secure, make sure it's under compliance, make sure all of these things are in place before it goes out into our, my production environment. That is where we evolved into the DevOps world. So as you all know, with DevOps, DevOps is really at the very core root um, of its methodology. It basically is about breaking down the walls between dev and ops, and it is even involved into um, breaking down the walls of security. So we can incorporate that into what we're doing as well here. But at the end of the day, this is where the automation piece came in. The handoffs became more automated within these DevOps um, best practices, as well as the collaboration started to happen. So devs started to understand what they needed to tell the ops side of the house, and all of those walls began to break down. So in theory, this should have been a great state. Well, guess what? <laughs> As we move into more of a cloud native world from a software development lifecycle standpoint, um, now we're looking at containerization. We're looking at microservices. We're looking at concepts around containers like Kubernetes. Um, so cloud native really has brought an additional layer of complexity uh, where you know, these environments are very dynamic in nature. So how do we handle all of that? So let's see. Let's talk about GitOps because we believe that in this cloud native world, as we're modernizing applications, GitOps is a great piece and a great component to help us get there. So my um, roadmap here, oops, I'm sorry, I actually, um, I'm gonna take a step back. I'm having a little difficulty on the, the presentation piece. So bear with me, I'll get used to this. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about what I'm going to talk about today. I always like to kind of level set so you all know exactly what I'm going to be talking about. So we're going to, we're going to dive into what is GitOps, our definition of that, what it means. Also, we're going to look at why 
Why is it important? What are some of the benefits? Why are so many organizations moving toward GitOps? And then how do you do GitOps? Things like, how do you arrange a team? How do you build your team? What does that look like? Also, we're gonna look at um, some of the barriers to adoption, some of those challenges uh, to adopting GitOps. So let's start in the easy one. What is GitOps? <laughs> so just like many technology terms that we have today, um, GitOps actually has many different definitions in the industry. So I'm gonna level set here and I'm going to take you through a very definitional state of what is GitOps from our perspective. So essentially it's an operational uh, framework that incorporates the DevOps best practices used for ap application development, things like version control, collaboration, compliance, CICD automation, and basically taking those concepts that we know are tried and true from a DevOps standpoint and applying them to infrastructure automation. So really bringing together the dev side with the operations side. So for all intents and purposes, you could really just call this DevOps for infrastructure. I'm actually gonna take you now into an equation <laughs> or my version of the equation here of what GetOps is kind of breaking down three main components. And we'll talk through each of these components here as well. So GitOps equals infrastructure as code. I'm actually gonna challenge you on that because I believe that that is more than just infrastructure. It can be anything that operations works on. So it can be things like policy as code. It can be things like configuration as code, infrastructure as code. So I will actually challenge myself and you to think about how this will look from a GitOps perspective. Then we look at MRs, which is a merge request. Merge requests plus the CI CD automation. So there are our beautiful components of GitOps. Storing infrastructure as code in your Git repository, using merge requests or MRs to actually be that change agent. We'll go through each one of these components specifically and we'll talk about exactly what they do so you get a really clear understanding of what that means. Last but not least, super important from our standpoint is are the automation piece for the reconciliation loop. This ensures that our infrastructure is always up to date at any given time. Let's go into infrastructure as code. And essentially, this is your declarative code that describes the desired state. Again, here's where I'm gonna challenge you to think outside of just infrastructure. You're gonna think about configuration. You're gonna think about policy as code. You are going to think about anything essentially that the operations team does can you put it as code? Why? We'll talk about that in a little bit of what those benefits of putting it in as code. Um, basically, infrastructure as code is stored in this Git repository and it has version control. Version control is extremely powerful when you incorporate it into sort of this infrastructure as code concept, right? So it helps us with things like rollback, et cetera. So if mistakes happen, something happens in the infrastructure, maybe somebody goes out there and manually makes a change in the infrastructure, we can have that audit trail to be able to roll back very quickly. So our mean time to recovery is much, much faster. The Git tooling as a user interface is actually super exciting and should be very exciting for the operations teams, right? So this is a user interface that is extremely easy to use. Uh, it's tried and tested, and it's something that they can actually take on without feeling bur burdensome uh, by you know, learning yet another solution or tool. MRs, so merge requests as the agent of change, right? So essentially this is the merging of one branch into others. So you have your GitOps main branch becomes your main production branch, if you will. And then whatever is in that environment is your single source of truth. And then you have uh, various branches that then would merge into that main branch. <clears throat> Excuse me. So merge requests is what we call it here at GitLab. Um, other solutions, we'll call it as a pull request, uh, PRs. Uh, basically, those are your gate, right? So this has to happen. The MR or the PR has to happen before any change gets invoked on the back end. Um, MRs are super important from my standpoint. One of my actual favorite things within um, the GitLab repository and the GitLab solution is really our merge request because this allows coming from an auditing background, this allows us to really truly understand and define 
the audit trail and be able to deliver that to the compliance folks as well as the auditors in a very easy to use. So what happened? When did it happen? Who was involved? Who approved it? And when did it go? Did it automatically get pushed? How, how did all of these things happen? It's your sort of single source of truth from an audit and compliance and governance standpoint. So many people can contribute to the merge requests, but you can define who's actually approving that merge request based on security elements, compliance elements, governance, et cetera. Uh, so super um, configuration uh, is super easy to do within merge requests. Let's talk a little bit about the last component here, which is CICD, or essentially our automated reconciliation. So we call our CICD uh, the reconciliation loop. What does that mean? It actually means <clears throat> that a couple things. So number one, you can use an agent that lives in, for instance, a Kubernetes cluster, right? So the Kubernetes operator, it goes out, it pulls the information back, and it allows you to understand kind of where that infrastructure is at. Or you can use an agent, agent list push base where your CICD is always running um, or even running on a regular schedule and it's checking in on the environment. Basically, it looks for the defined state that we defined up front and it syncs things as we need them. So super, um, super powerful from an automation standpoint. Either way is totally fine by us. But we see that as you implement GitOps, some folks are using Kubernetes, some people aren't. So we don't want to like take out if you're not using Kubernetes as you know one of the checkboxes that you can't do uh, GitOps. We don't believe that. We believe it can actually be used together in some environments when you're using a Kubernetes cluster, as well as if you're not. You can still see the power and get the benefits of GitOps. So no manual with CICD and the automated reconciliation loop that we have here, there's no manual updates to the infrastructure that is needed. So let's talk about the GitOps flow. What does this look like from a flow perspective? So let's take an overarching look at what this is, right? So at the end of the day, this looks very similar and should look very similar to you on application development. It's supposed to be that way. Remember what we're doing here is we're bringing in ops and we're doing infrastructure as code. So it's going to look like a software development lifecycle, perhaps. So the creating of the issue, the main branch, the new change to the infrastructure happens at that point. You create the new issue. This is the change. This is why the change is going to happen. Once we have all the gates and all the approvals to move forward, we then create the merge request. Remember the merge request actually is our agent of change. This is what makes that change happen in the Git repository. So from that, you create that merge request. This includes the collaboration. It includes your compliance bits. It also includes the audit trail, the change. Um, and then eventually you will, what we call commit your changes. The committing your changes happens. It automatically runs your CI pipeline, which runs all those checkpoints. Uh, that you've defined and make sure that everything is essentially is. copacetic. So then we have essentially a review app. What the review app will do and can do for you is take a look at what that future state will look like. We haven't yet pushed this into, let's say, our production environment yet. The change hasn't gone, but we can take a look at that review app and see the change that's going to happen. It gives us a really good insight into what that will look like. And then at that point, since we can then start to pull in the rest of the teams and the cross-functional teams, into the peer review and discussions around this particular change. Everybody can contribute. A small portion of people can approve based on how you define that. So as we move through this, we then merge our merge request. The issue is now closed. The C CD pipeline runs and automatically deploys. And then you begin to monitor your app just like you would normally. Um, so that is our GetOps flow. Um, Again, it shouldn't, shouldn't shock you, uh, but I did want to kind of take you through the step-by-step -step, uh, flow here. So a lot of the questions that we get when we present topics around GitOps is, um, what is the difference between GitOps and infrastructure as code? So 
The difference is infrastructure as code may or may not be version controlled. Infrastructure as code, code changes may or may not go through the right, uh, the defined review and approval process. And then changes in infrastructure as code only can be applied in many ways. And in some ways it may apply manually, it may not be automated. All very fine and great practices if that is the level of maturity that your organization is in. What GitOps allows you to do is, again, get that code into the Git repository, have the ability to use the version control and leverage the version control, and then enact any changes, document those changes automatically within the merge request, and have your infrastructure updated, updates be pushed automatically into the infrastructure. So that's the main differences that we see between GitOps and infrastructure as code. So essentially, we say it's infrastructure as code done right. That's what GitOps is. So let's talk about, I'm gonna kinda of go a little bit faster here as I'm doing a time check, about why it's important with GitOps, uh, why GitOps is important, excuse me. So at the end of the day, I talked a little bit about some benefits, but I'm going to explicitly talk about the benefits now. So access code, again, I told you I was gonna challenge you on this, that it's not just infrastructure, it's, it can be a lot more than just infrastructure is code. So what happens when you put things in as code, whether it's policy, configuration, uh, infrastructure, you automatically, almost by default, get a self-documenting um, concept going on because it's all right there. And when you start to self-document your environments, obviously you'll have your full-blown documentation outside of the system, but when you start to document the process and the how-to, it actually can then be shared among your teams um, very, very easily. They can look back, they can see what you had done before and be invited in to participate in that collaborative uh, motion. Another real um, clear benefit of putting everything as code is, again, duplicating in environments becomes a very, very easy task at that point. Next, version control be benefits with rollback and roll forward capabilities. So if you have an issue, you can sync up your, um, your app with the version, with the infrastructure change, and rollback if that's what you need to do. Basically, net-net, what happens here is that at every point in time or every version, you have that capability to roll back or even roll forward. What does this do? This lowers that, M, uh, that mean time to recovery, right? Uh, the MTTR gets much, much lower and you're up and running more quickly, which is a huge value to, especially in the infrastructure world when something goes down. Next, uh, automation benefits. I think I kind of already talked a lot about this, so I won't spend a ton of time on this. Automation is huge. If your organization is ready to do automation, it, it becomes a huge benefit. It eliminates the human risk um, of manually pushing something that perhaps somebody wasn't supposed to do, didn't understand that something else was going on on this side in the infrastructure or on this side of the infrastructure. So you can actually deploy uh, faster and more often. Um, and then you also have, um, we, we basically help to manage that configuration drift for you. That's basically when your infrastructure doesn't match your set of configuration. Maybe there's a failure, uh, a misconfiguration, and maybe someone did a manual change. So this actually, the automation runs, it will update it to that known state. All throughout this, not to be excluded, because again, I, I believe that one of the main reasons that organizations move to more of a GitOps is really around security and compliance. Um, I would add an audit trail in there. Auditing is huge. You know, who made the change? Why did they make the change? When, when they come in to audit certain things within the system, within the infrastructure, you will have that right at your fingertips with how you're doing, um, how you're doing it, who did it, and when they did it. <clears throat> also, from a granting permission standpoint, Basically, all you have to do when you work in a pure automated fashion with CICD is you grant the permissions to the Git repository. Um, many contribute um, to this process um, from a security and a compliance standpoint, but only a certain number of people are, are approving. So that is a huge piece of what we're doing here with GitOps. So let's move on to how to do GitOps. 
Um, so I'm going to go through this really uh, very quickly. We have a couple more slides here and then I want to get to uh, some of your questions. So from our standpoint, one of the, the biggest values that I can provide to you is to show you kind of what we're seeing from a GetOps team uh, perspective. So this is our best practice. Um, so it's really the at the top where you have the slices of um, yellow. That's your development microservices teams that are comprised of devs and SREs. And everything is really going toward that microservice where they are being a task to own that microservice um, from beginning to end. Now, when I say beginning to end, that does not necessarily mean that they need to own the platform or the infrastructure, right? So what we're seeing is we're seeing the rise of the operations platform team that you see here doesn't necessarily, Kubernetes is not a requirement. Uh, you, can, you can store infrastructure as code and do a merge request as the change agent. The platform team can basically provide you the platform as a service with or without Kubernetes. So really that's where the value of the operations platform team is. And then obviously you have the infrastructure team that you know, is working in a dynamic environment, spinning up and down cloud environments and or using bare metal. So let's talk a little bit about technologies because this is another piece is how do you do it? What tools do you use? So um, I would say on my left hand side here is sort of my laundry list of the technologies that um, I believe are super important to contributing to the GitOps um, solution. Number one, it's got the name right in it is the Git repository. Um, I can't not to say that. Um, and then the next layer down is the Git management uh, tool. So obviously GitLab, GitHub, and Bitbucket kind of fit into that management solution. It's where you get that version control from. Then we also have uh, CI or continuous integration tools out there that are necessary to implement GitOps, as well as continuous delivery. And you can see things like GitLab, Jenkins, Spinnaker, CircleCI, and Weaveworks Flux in those tools. We also are looking at a container registry, so you have that single state, uh, GitLab and Docker here, and then really where sort of in this configuration manager and infrastructure provisioning, we see, we see a lot of, on the configuration manager side, we see a lot of Ansible. Um, we see Chef and Puffet, but I would say, you know, sort of the standout there is Ansible as of to date. Uh, infrastructure provisioning, we're seeing a lot of Terraform. More and more, we're seeing Pulumi. And then obviously in the AWS world, we see the cloud formation. Um, and then on the container orchestration side, it's really all about Kubernetes. So last slide here, before we get to our questions, is some of the challenges. So. I would say the number one challenge that we see is having those operation engineers um, shifting to be more dev centric in the way that they do their own work. And really what that means is they're just not used to thinking about sort of things as code uh, as you wish. Um, and it's really a cultural change. Um, we've actually seen both sides where Dev has taught operations to be more dev centric. And as soon as that light bulb goes off from an operation standpoint, they're like, wow, this is really amazing. We see a tremendous amount of value. But conversely, I've also seen a very mature operations organization who is all about um, automation that have actually pulled a sort of manual uh, software development lifecycle development teams into the world of automation. So it's been a very fun ride for me to see that. But I would say net net, you need to evaluate as you go through this, uh, sort of where is your operations engineer's head? Are you ready to take on, to my second bullet, a sophisticated level of deployment automation? Um, if you're not, start with automation somewhere else. Maybe it's automated testing. Uh, maybe it's implementing CI, CD. Uh, try automation somewhere else so that you can get those baby steps so folks can understand whether or not this automation is something they can take on. And then also the, one of the biggest sort of, although I said I'm going to challenge you around everything is code from an operational standpoint, not everything belongs as code. Uh, not everything belongs in the Git repos repository. Things that we've seen that don't really belong there, don't really fit are gonna be observability tools, feature flags, and incident management. So net-net, what we talked about is what it is, 
why get ops and how to do get ops. We talked about some of those values. We talked about the components, the infrastructure as code, the merge request as your change agent, and the CI CD as um, your reconciliation loop. We talked a little bit about a, how to set up your teams, what tools to use, and some of the challenges around GitOps. And that now concludes my presentation. I'm going to bring my colleague, William Chia, on, um, online right now to help me out with some of the questions that you may have. If we have some live questions, that would be great. William Chia is our product marketing uh, GitOps evangelist here at uh, GitLab, and he is amazing. So, which is why I'm bringing him on. Hi, William, are you there? Yeah, Tina, great to uh, hear everything you had to say about GitOps today. And uh, looking forward to questions from the audience that both of us can handle together. Probably folks can either type them into the chat box uh, or I think there's a Q&A function within Zoom as well. All right. Um, thanks, first of all, uh, Tina, for the presentation. Um, yeah, li like you said, we now have a few, uh, two or three minutes left for the Q&A. So I would uh, read out the questions that I got so far. It's it's free at all. So uh, let's start, I would say, and then you two can decide uh, who will go into those. Um, the first question That's would great. be, um, why can I do GitOps with Terraform? Isn't that enough? So William, I did a lot of talking. You want to give your perspectives of the and and why Terraform doesn't do all of GitOps? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure if I uh, understand all the perspective. I would say if you if you're doing GitOps, almost assuredly you are using Terraform. Uh, so there are some other tools. I think like Tina mentioned, Pulumi, uh, CloudFormation, other types of templating engines. I have a we have a colleague that um, has written their own custom, um, you know, uh, kind of Terraform-esque templating engine. Um, so there's a lot of ways to do GitOps. Uh, I wouldn't say you have to use Terraform. There are a lot of tools out there, but I would say almost assuredly um, you can use Terraform. And so then the question would be, uh, if, I'm, if I'm using Terraform, does that de facto mean I am doing GitOps? And, and I would say no. Uh, I would say that GitOps has a, has a few kind of structures around it that, uh, that, are part of the, that are part of the practice. And if you want to get all the value, um, it's really important that you use all of the components to it. So uh, for example, as I know I've chatted with Tina a lot, um, like I said, other colleagues at GitLab and especially with, with uh, GitLab customers and users, the biggest value that I hear most often, like I think Tina shared a really long list of here are like 15 or 16 different values you can get out of GitOps. But the one that I hear the most often is uh, the compliance value, the idea that you can get easy auditing out of um, who made which change at what time, and you have an easy way to audit your changes, and you have an easy way to adhere to any compliance policies you have, whether they're regulatory, whether they're internally, internal compliance, or whether you, um, you, know, you have certain certifications you're going for. When you've written your compliance policy and you need to adhere to that, uh, usually that involves only having certain people with the ability to access certain environments. And so having least privileged access is a big part of a lot of compliance policies. So uh, if, if you're using Terraform, it's an amazing tool, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're getting all the compliance benefits. So when you are doing GitOps, I think, Tina, what you talked about was the MR is the change agent. This is the idea that any, any code that gets eventually gets applied to production or any application code that gets deployed to production or, or really to any environment, staging or dev or any environments that you have, uh, the way that that code gets there is by being merged into that branch and then uh, an automated deployment taking place. And so having that MR as that change agent this is where you're doing code review, this is where you're doing peer review, this is where approvals can happen. So not just the actual person merging it and enacting that change, but uh, a certain bit of code might need like a security review or might need a regional review in order to, to adhere to your compliance policy. So uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot to it that's more than just doing infrastructure as code. Uh, certainly doing the infrastructure code is a component of it, 
but the automation is a, is a really important component of it. And especially doing the code reviews, the approvals, and the merge, uh, the merge access, the person who actually has the ability to merge that code, those compliance components are a big part of GitOps. Right. Thank you very much for that detailed answer. Um, as we are running out of time, I would say let's take one last question, um, which is um, what if I'm not ready to take on all at GitOps? Uh, where else can I start and what values do I get? Uh, I'll jump into this one and then Tina, if you have uh, kind of sure. additional things to share. Um, yeah, I would say like any type of technology practice, like doing agile software development, I think uh, Tina's original, she kind of started out talking about some different phases that software development has gone through. Um, so just kind of like when you start adopting agile transformation, that doesn't happen in one day. Some large enterprise organizations I've seen take, you know, three or four or five years to, in order to transform their entire organization before they're really doing agile software development. I think it's the same thing with DevOps. You start somewhere and then you make small changes. And it's the same thing I think with GitOps. So you don't necessarily need a sophisticated, I have everything is completely mature CD. Everything is 100% automated. There's nothing manual. Uh, I've containerized everything. Everything is in a very sophisticated Kubernetes cluster and I'm doing microservices and I have service mesh and you know, you don't need to have everything sophisticated tomorrow. You can start out with start defining some of your environments and infrastructure as code, you know, using something like Ansible or Terraform, these kind of infrastructure as code tools. And uh, using that kind of merge request, you can start doing some code reviews. And really with that kind of simple introduction, you can do that even on just one or two environments. You don't even necessarily do it on production. You can try it on one project in one, in let's say your staging environment or your dev environment. You can start very, very small and then incrementally change. That's kind of what I've seen folks whenever, whenever an organization or a team is adopting any type of new technology, whether it's agile or GitOps or, or uh, any kind of new cultural change because there's practice that comes along with the technology. That's kind of what I've seen successful. I don't know, Tina, if you've got some thoughts on driving change in your organization. Yeah, I think that from a cultural standpoint is really um, think about and evaluate the organization from a uh, the standpoint of is your ops team ready to, to think more like a developer and have more developer centric. I'd also state that, um, which I stated during the presentation, but I did want to highlight, um, don't think you have to do Kubernetes. <laughs> within your environment in order to get the GitOps value. Um, I will leave that there because I know we're a little over time and I apologize, but um, I think that is it. Are we going to close? Um, yeah, um, I think for now we got it. Um, thanks again for the presentation, Tina, and uh, for going into the questions also to William. Thanks for being here. Um, 